Tonight, we head to Ferguson, Missouri, where Governor Jay Nixon has asked the National Guard to begin moving out of the city. This is the climate on the situation of the ground begins to simmer, following riots, looting, and angry protests. Tonight, we are taking a close look at race relations and the police, and we will hear from you. And it has now been 40 years, believe it or not, since Richard Nixon resigned from office amid the Watergate scandal. And former Connecticut Governor Lowell Weicker, who served on the Senate Watergate Committee, the last surviving member of that committee, he speaks to RFL about the scandal. And we'll also get his take on the state of politics today. Plus, Israel's prime minister vows to continue fighting Hamas after taking down three of the group's senior leaders. And Hamas claims responsibility for the kidnapping and execution of those three Israeli teenagers. Tonight, Ambassador Ido Haroroni joins us. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to RFL. I am Richard French, and thank you so much for joining us. A lot to get to in the next 60 minutes, but we begin this evening in Ferguson, Missouri, where the governor, as I mentioned, is ordering the National Guard to begin withdrawing from Ferguson. Protests across the city, they have taken on a calmer tone following a visit from the U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder. We're going to get the latest tonight from ABC's Marcy Gonzalez. More protests today. Demonstrators not only demanding action against the officer who shot and killed Michael Brown, but calling for a new prosecutor in the case. Presenting a petition they say has 70,000 signatures, calling on Robert McCullough to recuse himself. People have made a statement to Bob McCullough in that they have no confidence in his ability to be fair and impartial. McCullough is calling on Missouri's governor to decide if he'll be removed, saying he has no plans to step down and will continue presenting to a grand jury, quote, in a fair, full, and impartial manner. Among the evidence the grand jury will consider, this video from moments after Brown was killed by Officer Darren Wilson. A witness saying in the background the shots were fired as the unarmed 18-year-old walked towards the officer. Despite some tension between Wilson supporters and other demonstrators on the street, we want justice! police call last night one of the calmest yet, saying people felt reassured after Attorney General Eric Holder's visit yesterday. Long after this tragic story no longer receives this level of attention, the Justice Department will continue to stand with Ferguson. And today, Missouri's governor ordered the National Guard to start drawing down, but we're told for now there will not be a change to the heavy police presence here. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Ferguson, Missouri. Thank you, Marcy. Now, the Attorney General Eric Holder not just was there, but he also spoke and had a personal um, address regarding um, the people of Ferguson, saying that he understands some of the anger that they feel surrounding Brown's death and that broken relationship the community now has with the police. I wanted the people of Ferguson to know that I personally understood that mistrust. I wanted them to know that while so much else may be uncertain, this attorney general and this Department of Justice stands with the people of Ferguson. Now, he also went on to say to Mr. Holder that, quote, I am the attorney general of the United States, but I'm also a black man. I've confronted this myself. And he reflected on um, his encounters, um, sometimes negative, with the police, saying that years ago, he and his cousin were stopped while on their way to a movie theater in Washington. Calder said, at the time they stopped me, I was a federal prosecutor. I wasn't a kid. A federal prosecutor. I worked for the U.S. Department of Justice. He said the encounter left him angry and upset. He said he also became angry after being pulled over twice um, on the New Jersey Turnpike when the officer asked to search his car. He also said that he sympathizes, though, with the police, saying that his brother's a retired law enforcement officer and Holder knows, he says, the dangers that police face every day on the job and the split-second decisions that they sometimes are being forced to make. And while protests in Ferguson have started to simmer over the last couple nights here, tensions, though, are still high as members of the community and those who support Michael Brown's family are calling for the arrest of the officer involved in the shooting, Darren Wilson, who, as you know, fired those six shots that took Brown's life. However, there are also many people backing Officer Wilson, saying that although we don't know all of the facts, they believe the shooting was justified. And there was an op-ed piece written 
by a 17-year vet of the L.A. police force who said that many deaths like Brown's can be avoided. Officers saying, quote, Cops are not murderers. No officer goes out in the field wishing to shoot anyone armed or unarmed. If you don't want to get shot, tased, pepper sprayed, struck with a baton, or thrown to the ground, just do what I tell you. Don't argue with me. Don't call me names. Don't tell me that I can't stop you. Don't say I'm a racist pig. Don't threaten that you'll sue me and take away my badge. He also said that most field stops are complete in minutes. How difficult is it to cooperate for that long? Well, with those different, um, let's say, sound points in this conversation, as we did last night, we ask you to be part of ours. And we got some terrific reaction last night. We couldn't even get to a fraction of the calls um, and some of the social media comments you make. But I'm going to ask you, as we open up our phone lines now, to be part of our dialogue again this evening. You see the toll-free number, 38-766-2428. Um, and we're focusing on the issue of race and politics. And while I want everyone to share... I particularly would love people, whether they're in law enforcement um, or that they're people of color in this country that can reflect on some of their own personal uh, stories um, and, and join us, please, in that conversation. I say us because I'm joined um, by uh, the two guys I share this uh, stage with every night or set or whatever you want to call the thing. Uh, I got Andrew Wiven, senior political correspondent, and Dominic, Water, uh, Dominic Carter, political journalist and author. Um, you, you heard what the attorney general had to say. Um, driving while black here, also stopped because he's running to get from one place to another and making a point that he wasn't a kid at the time, he was a federal prosecutor in the Justice Department, etc. You've talked about some of that yourself. The conversations that have happened in this country for the better part of a week now, um, I'm sure you've talked to some colleagues you've had over the years who've given their own story of it. This is not as simple as just one shooting in Missouri, is it? No, not at all, Richard. I strongly recommend, um, you have ties in the black community, and so does Andrew. I strongly recommend that everyone on one Saturday just go to an African-American barbershop and listen to what the men there say. And they will all describe what the attorney general uh, described in terms of his personal experience with the police. Here's the problem. Disproportionately, you have blacks committing crimes, or at least convicted for crimes, okay? Disproportionately. It doesn't represent what we represent in terms of the population. And so there's a sentiment in law enforcement that many minorities are the ones committing crime. But you cannot make that blanket statement on everyone. I've told you this story. My son has epilepsy. Biggest teddy bear you could ever meet, about my size. He was running, uh, Andrew has met him, he was running. See, it, as a black man, that's almost a crime. He was running to get to a restroom because he has a bladder issue. Police officer in Rockland County stopped him, get on the ground, spread eagle. This is a kid, never had any involvement with law enforcement. So now, he, he was 15 years old at the time, and what do you think he thinks about cops? The only encounter he had with cops, he was told the officer held his hand on his gun and made him get spread eagle on the ground. And then when he realized that my son wasn't doing anything wrong, it was only then that he was let go. That's not the way to better relations with the community. And, you know, we've had this conversation, Andrew. I was starting to think about this today when the um, attorney general talked about We've talked about driving while black and the New, Jer New Jersey turnpike and, and all the data that came out about uh, who was being stopped and, and what they found. We talked about the stop and frisk program and the broken windows uh, idea of quality of life policing, but who it disproportionately impacts. Um, it's going to be very interesting how this plays out from who the prosecutor is going to be and, and questions about whether or not he's equipped or not. And he said, time out, I've, had, I've been elected here with more than 30% margins in every election. Now, all of a sudden, I'm not equipped to do this because I'm white and i got some family members who work in law enforcement. This is, this is not as simple as maybe some folks want to make it, on, regardless of somebody's perspective. This is really as much as black and white. There's shades of gray in this thing. You and I and Dominic all know that there's a process that goes on to these things, that prosecutors and there are grand juries, and there's a system in play that goes to all this. But just like we were talking about with the Garner case, even more so in Ferguson, I think the process matters less to the overall outcome than the result. I mean, in the Garner case, if people sense that it's being handled fairly, I have a feeling that the reception publicly 
might be more amicable regardless of what that outcome happens to be. I just can't imagine life in Ferguson returning to anything close to normal unless the officer is indicted, arrested, tried, and convicted. I can't imagine that this sits well enough in the community that we don't see at least some measure of reprise of what we're seeing in Ferguson now. It, that it hasn't happened in the Gardner case in Staten Island is something close to a miracle already, and we'll see what happens on Saturday with the rally that uh, Reverend yeah. Sharpton is happening. And happening. just as a uh, just a promotional thing here, Dominic, tomorrow night, uh, I'm going to be with you, but you've taken point here. You've spoken to all, basically every principal involved in this case, uh, from the police side, from the PBA, to obviously members of the Garner family. Uh, I've also spoken to somebody, in fact, that, that we'll share with the audience tomorrow, used to be uh, in the district attorney's office in Staten Island, but has also handled... Uh, uh, you know, cases um, uh, where there's even including settlements against the police, including the officer in question in Staten Island. So we'll have, we'll have all of that tomorrow. But the police officer who wrote that op-ed piece, um, I believe it's the LA Times, right? Uh, or in the Washington Post, but he Washington was with Post. the LA uh, Police Department who said, you know, part of the problems is people don't want to listen to cops and then problems stem from that. If you listen and you don't disrespect me and you do what I say, this thing will all be over. What do you say when you've heard that? Because I've heard other people say that not in front of the camera, but they say, you know what? Somebody told me, you know, uh, stop where you are. I don't keep coming at them. This is part of the problem that we run into. All of us have a lot of respect for police officers, the jobs that they do. Well, do you think do? that's true? We do at this table. Do you think there is... <clears throat> For whatever yes. reasons, a lot of communities who, who look at the cops and say, for, first, they're the enemy in the community, and second of all, I don't respect them. I'm going to tell them as much. Well, I, I, I think any reasonable person does not see a police officer as an enemy because when you're in trouble, what's the first thing you're going to do? 911, you want the police to come to your aid, and they will come to your aid. But... Somebody needs to talk to these people that are putting out these op-eds. They need to get some media advice. He proved in that piece every bit of criticism that people of color have against the police department. We respect the police, but guess what? You're not God. You're not God. And in communities of color, they act like they're some, act like they're God, Richard. You can't just order me to, or any other person to get spread eagle on the floor and can I, can I check your car? Now that's a, that's a trick question because legally you can say no in some states and then they have to uh, find probable cause, get the police dogs and blah, 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 blah. But you gotta know as a person of color, if they ask you, can I search your car and you say no, that means you're going downtown no matter what. The charge is gonna be obstruction of justice, resisting arrest, whatever the case may be, you're going downtown. You're going through the system. Don, Don, I'm sorry, Don, you're being very polite about all this. What, what the officer said is garbage. I am trying to be, what the I am said, trying to be what very the officer polite. Said is garbage, let's be honest. Uh, and we all have a lot of respect for cops and the, di and the difficult job that they have, but that's garbage. Respect is not something that you get from having a badge and a gun on you. Respect is something that is earned. And you want respect, you have to show respect. Where's that two-way street? In the most chaotic of situations, yeah, absolutely, the cops are entitled to the benefit of the doubt. But on a simple street stop, regardless of race or color or, or the, the incidents of all, how about respecting the person who you're stopping if you want some respect back? Well, on that point here, we're going to jump to break. When we come back, we're going to bring the audience into our conversation, too. And you know the phone number here. Um, I, I want to get your take on this one. And again, uh, any uh, walk of life you're in, we want to hear from you. But especially, I'd love to hear if you've been on both sides of this particular equation. Join us. We'll be right back.